So Jamie, what can people expect at the show? What are you gonna, what do you see? I see the bear over there. I, amongst a bunch of paintings and, you know, I mean, you go to art shows these days, everybody's been to a few. It's like a room full of paintings. Everybody walks around like, oh wow, these are great paintings. Big breakthrough, you're a genius, way to go. You know, it's like, that's what art shows are. And I wanted this one to be more like, it took you to a place. Like it has the feeling that you went back in time. Yeah, it's like uh, I'm recreating a saloon from my neighborhood from the 1850s. Is that what all this is here? Yeah, this is a hundred year old redwood fence that I came across and used it to make a stagecoach and this bar. And I want the viewers from this show to come away with a better sense and a better understanding of why California is the place it is and more specifically why San Francisco is the place that it is. I mean, when you look at a city that up until 1840 was still, you know, a few thousand people living here. It really wasn't a huge bustling city and the draw of gold and the draw of this new life and the draw of the possibilities to get out from under wherever else you were in the world and run here and find this magical gold and literally change your situation overnight, that attracts a certain type of person. And it's that adventurous person who ran out here to try and find that instant wealth that either did or didn't, or maybe they came out here to steal it from somebody that did. There was that too. Like, the core to this show is like, what type of person came here and why? And like, what are the parallels between modern San Francisco and like the OG San Francisco? So, uh, Jeremy, what's the, what's the story behind the bear? Okay, down the street from here, uh, on Pacific and Montgomery, there used to be a bar called the Fierce Grizzly. That part of Pacific was called the Roaring Pacific because it had so many burly bars on it. One of them was called the Fierce Grizzly. And the Fierce Grizzly was known as such because it had a giant female grizzly bear chained to the door and they kept her drunk so she wouldn't eat patrons. And rumor has it you could order a bear shot, which is where they soak the bear's paw in alcohol and then she socks you in the face. Are you serious? Yeah, I don't know if that's true or not, but that's, that's the rumor. So the bear would kind of get people to come into the bar? The bear was an attraction and the, com com the, the competing bar was called the Boar's Head where a lady had sex with a pig on stage. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah. Uh, there was another bar in the neighborhood that had a guy who for money would eat garbage. Like he, his body could process all kinds of things. There was another guy, uh, Oofty Goofty, who would take a beating for money. He had like dead nerve endings and like you could pay him money and then punch him or hit him with a bat. Did the uh, bear ever go after anybody? Uh, believe it or not, I can't find a ton about that bar. I just read it in one of my books and then tried to Google it and find more, and it's just one of those things that lives kind of as a one-liner legendary deal. Like, yeah, there was a bar with a bear that lived in there. And I just think it establishes just like, just how fucking raw it was here at that time, you know? You're probably the one I used for the postcard. Uh, this one. I read all this stuff about the symbol of the phoenix and like why the city chose to use it and it was because of our resilience and the city's ability to rebuild itself in a time where, you know, construction was fairly primitive and firefighting equipment was fairly primitive and we were a city that was burning down on a regular basis, mostly due to vandalism and like, you know, dudes lighting fires to cause problems, but like, we re rebuilt the city in record time and the Phoenix became a symbol of the city's resiliency from like, drama, you know, like we were able to burn to the ground and build that shit back up and this one's kind of like, the foundations of the city, you know, like they built uh, hotels and restaurants out of boats. There was Spanish influence. There was people living in tents. There was shacks, all very flammable. And so when the city burned to the ground, we crushed down and built up on that. So when you flip the painting, it's like on the remnants of the original city, we crushed down, buried a bunch of motherfuckers and built up. So it's kind of like, uh, I feel like it's significant to the show because it, like I said, I want this show to be one that like instills a sense of pride in people that live here. Like sort of realize that we live in a fucked up city because the foundations were fucked up and the people that came here to build this city were crazy. And half the reason there's still a lot of crazy people here is because there's that magnetism. Like California in general and San Francisco specifically like have that magnetism for that adventurous personality. Like it's that place that people run to to go be whoever they want to be. And I think that those underlying themes of developing a city and people running here by the thousands for a, for a, for a, you know the the promise of gold or the promise of wealth or the promise of a future that you might not have on the east coast or in Europe or wherever you came from and that's kind of what like San Francisco is built on like that that myth of like I'm going to run out there and be this guy whether it be a millionaire or I'm going to be an actor or I'm going to be a 
You know, like California has that draw. Like people run here to become this thing they want to be. It's like chasing the dream. I think the term back then they called it, they, they called it seeing the elephant. Like, and I don't know exactly what that means, but the roots of like, if someone was leaving the East Coast to run out to California for the gold rush, they said you were seeing the elephant or he's off to see the elephant. <laughs> and I think it's kind of like going to see that imaginary thing that may or may not be there. Because when most people arrived here, the, the media surge of the gold rush was just exactly that. I mean, by the time people got here, it took them a year and a lot of that gold that they came looking for was already long since gone. So it's, uh, that's kind of an underlying theme of the show, like running to California and like why people run here and like what makes it attractive to a certain type of person. Tell us about these sculptures. I have a friend in Indonesia named Neoman, who's a wood sculptor that I've been working with now for the last three years. And Neoman and I have done a bunch of projects together, some frames and some statues. And this time I decided, after like he got to know my style, I got to know his style, I think these are the most successful things we've made together because I kind of combine both projects into one. It's like a frame and a statue. And I think after all the back and forth, Neoman's really learned my style really well and I've kind of learned his capabilities. And I gave him more time to do these than the stuff in the past and less detail and made them a lot simpler. And I'm really, really, really happy with them. Are they uh, solid wood? Yes. What kind of wood is it? Uh, How much do they weigh each? Cumulatively, they weigh 500 pounds. Like, that's what it said on the invoice from the shipping company. Like, I shipped 500 pounds of Indonesian tree in America. <laughs> and uh, I don't know why he didn't hollow out the backs. It was something that I never talked to him about. And when something like this just exists in your head, you don't... I didn't really think about how much it would weigh, to be honest. I was, like, too excited, like, I want to make them <laughs> Yeah. And, uh, yeah, he didn't hollow them out, and so they weigh a ton, but my good friend Francisco, woodworker extraordinaire, has helped me design these big blocks so they mount on the wall and won't kill anybody. Can I knock one? Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. Really? That's like super solid. He's the, the bear is the biggest and he literally weighs like 200 pounds. Like, it takes me and Dragon Eddie like serious effort to move them around. They're really sketchy. So how do you, do you give him a drawing? Like how does he know uh, what they... I give him a series of drawings, like different angles, back, front, side to side, three quarter view, and then we go back and forth through email. Like he'll start, and if he has questions, or an individual, like how is this mouth open from the front, how's this hand look from the side kind of stuff, we'll do that through email. But on these we didn't really do as much back and forth as usual. He pretty much went straight off the drawings and got really far along before I even saw any emails. So he, he kind of knew what he was doing with these and in my opinion he killed them. Like I've never been happier with anything we did together. Careless moving pictures. The coast was described by one indignant critic as that sink of moral pollution. Good art show should have a theme song. So, <laughs> how can someone get a copy of this song, Aesop Rock? Uh, at the opening, we made this little like wooden postcard. Mm -hmm. It's got a screen print on both sides, and attached to it is a little flash drive. And on the flash drive is an MP3 of the song and a QuickTime video that shows all the artwork from the show and kind of the making of the artwork with the song over it. How so much are those? Uh, 15 bucks. Oh, so nice. it's like a screen print with a little zip flash drive that you can use for whatever. But it has a slideshow. It's basically a digital catalog for the art show with a song. Uh, Aesop owed me a favor and I asked him to write a song about all this. Like I gave him all the reference that I use and he read it. I kind of wrote his version of the history of this neighborhood and I actually really like it. And he's lived here for three years. I think it's high time that he writes something about San Francisco. <laughs>